Well, good morning, church. Good morning and welcome to First Colony. I'm so glad all of you are here today. And happy Mother's Day to all of our moms. We are so excited we get to celebrate you today. After all, we wouldn't be here without you. So thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for all you do. I'm blessed to have a wonderful mother. I'm blessed to be married to my beautiful bride, Alicia, who is a wonderful mother to our children. And it's an honor that today we get to just take a moment to celebrate you and to say thank you for all you do, for all you've done, for, for, for who you are. And we are so, so grateful. And we want to start there, but I also want to just take a moment as we begin and, and just pause for a moment because I realize that while this day is a day of celebration for so many of us, there are, there are many of you for whom this day is, is difficult. And, and that could be for a lot of reasons. Today you may be missing your mom. Uh, today you may be wanting to become a mom and that hasn't happened for you yet. Today you may, you may be missing a child. and For all those reasons and for so many others, I realize today can be a very difficult day. And I, I just want you to know we see you and we see your pain and we know what you're going through. And, and we love you and we care for you. We care about you. And we just want you to know we're not overlooking that today. And even more than that, uh, we have a God who sees, who cares, and who knows, and he is with you. And I, I just want to begin by just acknowledging that that is present in this day for us as well. But today um, we're going to bring this series called Roots and Wings to a Close. And some of you who've been looking at this tree, you're so glad to hear me say that. If you're a mom and you want a dead tree, come see me after uh, worship. I know a guy. Last week we talked to the dads, and this week I want to talk to the moms. Is there, is there any greater gift than having a mom who knows God, who loves God, um, who cares for you and cares about you? Uh, I thought I would begin today with a quote from the great mother, great philosopher, Dorothy from the Golden Girls, who once said, it's not easy being a mother. Uh, if it were easy, fathers would do it. <laughs> I think there's some truth in that. There's no greater gift than having a mom that loves us, who cares for us, who provides for us, who comes alongside of us, who's always there for us, who picks us up when, when we're hurting, who helps us when we're going through the difficulties of this life. I mean, what a tremendous gift, what a tremendous blessing that is. And that's, that's true for a lot of us. That was also true for a young lady by the name of Baru, who in 2018 graduated from Sakara University in Turkey with her law degree. And uh, this is a, really a pretty amazing story because what you need to know about Baru is she is visually impaired. She's legally blind. And what's more is the university, the university she attended uh, didn't have any books in Braille, didn't have anything on audio for her to listen to. You may be wondering, like, how in the world did she graduate with a law degree? I mean, to graduate from any university anywhere with a law degree, that's a, that's a pretty significant accomplishment for anyone. And here this young lady has done it, and she, she can't see. She can't see to read. She can't see to study. She, she, she has this disability that, that, that's really prevented her from, from having access to many of the tools that everybody else has access to. And you may be wondering, how did, she, how did she do this? Well, she was able to do this because, because of her mom. Her mom came alongside her, and for four long years, her mom read to her every textbook. She read to her every lecture note. She helped her study for every test. She helped her with every assignment. And because of her mom's help, because of her mother's love, after four years of law school, she was able to graduate, receive her diploma, and receive her law degree. Her professors, they knew what her mom had done. And after presenting Baru with her diploma and her law degree, they called her mom Hava to the stage and they presented her with an honorary law degree because of what she had done. Yeah, isn't that an amazing story? It's really a beautiful story. And it's an amazing testimony to a mother's love. And when we hear stories like this, what's incredible is they make the news. Like they grab the headlines. They grab our attention. Like they're interesting. And, and we see this and we're in awe and wonder and amazement of, of what this woman has done, what these two women have done. It's such an amazing thing that we get to, we get to see and hear about. And on the one hand, it really is amazing. 
But on the other hand, it's really not all that surprising, is it? I mean, this is just what moms do. Sometimes in big ways, but often in everyday, ordinary kinds of ways, this is what moms do. They love and they care and they support and they come alongside. They do these things when no one is looking to help and to encourage and to bless and to raise us up. This is, this is a mother's love, right? And we see this and our world sees this and they stand in awe. The culture we live in stands in awe because this is not the culture that we live in. We don't, we don't live in a culture that says it takes time over time for things to grow. We know this is true in nature. It takes time over time for plants to grow. Trees don't grow overnight. They don't become giant, magnificent trees overnight. It takes time over time to grow. And, and tree people are kind of like trees. It takes people time over time to grow. But the world we live in, the culture we live in, expects our kids, expects us to just show up and be great. I mean, we really want a team full of kids who can show up and just hit home runs, who can catch touchdown passes, who can score goals and win. We really want a classroom full of kids who can just show up and make straight A's. That's what we want. That's what our culture wants. And what happens consequently is that our kids are growing up in a world where they think they have to win. They think they have to make all A's in order to receive love. The culture we live in doesn't allow this time over time that's needed and necessary for people to grow. But moms know that what kids need most is this nurturing presence, this care, this attention, the support, the grace to grow and mess up and try again. You see, before a tree grows up, it has to grow down. And what kids really need are these deep roots that are allowed to grow down deep into the rich soil of God's great love. And if we want that, and if we want our kids to have these wings that are ready to fly and go forward into this world full of faith, hope, and love, that takes time over time. That takes care, and that takes nurture, and that takes attention, and that takes support. And if you're asking me, it really takes prayer. In fact, it all begins with prayer. Because you see, prayer prayer is a vital part of the process for our kids to be able to grow and flourish and thrive. Prayer is a vital. It is, it is necessary. If we want to see our kids grow, to grow and flourish and thrive, to know God, to love God and to serve God. And if you want to know what to pray, I know a lot of you are praying people. I know a lot of you moms are praying moms. But if you want to know what to pray for your sons and for your daughters, I want to point you to one of maybe my most favorite prayers in all of Scripture. If you have your Bible or if you have the Version Bible app, let me invite you this morning to open up to Ephesians chapter 3. In Ephesians 3, the Apostle Paul prays a prayer for his friends. In a lot of ways, these were his sons, his daughters in the faith. And I want you to see... What, what Paul prays for these people that he loved and he cared so much about. In Ephesians 3, it starts in verse 14. Paul writes this. He writes, when I think of all this, I fall to my knees and I pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. And, and, and when you read that, when I think of all this, that's what Paul starts with. You may be wondering, what is Paul thinking of? What is he talking about. And if you back up just a few verses, you can figure it out real quickly. What Paul is thinking of, what he has in mind as he begins this prayer is God's great love and God's great desire and God's great concern that everybody, everywhere and every time come to know the great love of God revealed in Jesus at the cross. The great love of God to save everyone, everywhere, Jew and Gentile alike. This is God's heart. This is God's desire. This is what God wants more than anything else is for everyone to come to know his great love revealed in his son Jesus. So Paul says, whenever I think of all this, when all of this comes into my mind, I fall to my knees in prayer. 
And I can't help but think that when a mother thinks of all that she has in her heart for her kids, God's incredible plan and God's great desire for them to know him, for them to love him, for him to save them. That in God's grace, a mother can come into the presence of God. And just like Paul, she may fall to her knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. And what does Paul pray? On his knees before our Father. The same thing I think we can pray, verse 16. He prays, I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, that he, that God will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. And in case you didn't know or in case maybe you forgot today, can I just remind you of this eternal truth that there is nothing that our God cannot do. He is not limited in any way. Everything, everywhere belongs to him. He is the God of abundance. He is sovereign over the entire universe. There is nothing he can't do. There is nothing outside of his reach. He is perfect in his power and his ability to meet absolutely every need. Like whatever you need, he's got it. In fact, whatever you need, he is. And when Paul prays for his sons and his daughters in the faith, this is what he prays for, that they would be empowered, that God would empower them with inner strength through his spirit. Because Paul knew something that we know, but sometimes we forget, that our willpower is no match for the war that is being waged against us. If we're trying to overcome whatever it is we're trying to overcome, whatever adversity we're up against, whatever temptation we're up against, if we're trying under our own power to overcome whatever it is we're trying to overcome, we'll never be able to do it. Not by our own power, not with our own strength. Paul knew that his people, the people that he loved so dearly and so desperately, his sons and daughters in the faith, needed a different kind of power. And so do you and so do our kids. We need power, the kind of power that comes from the presence of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of the living God living inside of you and me. And this is what he wanted for his sons and daughters in the faith, for them to know this kind of empowering, this kind of Holy Spirit power that's present in their lives. In other words, you can't do this on your own. You can't live this life on your own. You can only do it when the Spirit of the living God is living inside of you. And Paul prayed for them to be, to be empowered with that Spirit and then he prayed this in verse 17, that Christ would make us home in your hearts as you trust in him. Now you may want to underline that. You may want to highlight that. You may want to screenshot that if it's on your device. Because here's the gospel. Here's the good news for today. Christ Jesus wants, desires, longs to make his home in your heart. Think about that for a minute. Jesus Christ wants to make his home in your heart. And not just that, Jesus wants to make his home in the hearts and the lives of your kids. But watch this. Christ can't coexist with another. Like Jesus doesn't want a roommate. <laughs> he doesn't want to share the throne of your heart with anyone or anything else. Christ and Christ alone wants to sit on the throne of your heart. So the question that you have to ask, I have to ask, and keep asking and answering is simply this question. Like what or who do you need to evict out of your heart, off the throne of your heart, so that Christ and Christ alone can be seated on the throne of your heart? What needs to go? Who needs to go? So Christ and Christ alone can sit on the throne of your heart. What person, what problem, what worry, what pride, what sin? What is it? Who is it? That you need to escort out of the throne room of your heart so that Christ and Christ alone can sit on the throne of your heart. And parents, if I had to guess, there is nothing in this world that would make you happier than for you to know 
If you knew that you knew that you knew that Jesus was seated on the throne of your kid's heart, is there anything that would give you more peace? Is there anything that would give you more joy? Is there anything that would make you more content than just to know that you know that you know that Jesus and Jesus alone was seated on the throne in the hearts and lives of your kids? There's nothing, nothing that would make you happier, nothing that would give you more peace. But, but if that's true and if that's what you want, then you need to know that if, if you want to see this in your kids, then your kids need to see this in you. In other words, if you want to see Christ on the throne in their hearts, then they need to see Christ on the throne in your heart. If you want your kids to have Christ and Christ alone, seated on the throne in their hearts, then they need to see in your heart, in your life, Christ and Christ alone, seated on the throne. And by the way, this isn't a call for perfection. Perfection was never the expectation. This is a call to live faithfully, and consistently in the way of Christ. To live your life following as best you can in the way of Jesus. And to allow your kids to see you living for him every single day. When you do this, as you do this, this is what Paul writes as he continues to pray. He says that your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. That as you live in the way of Jesus, follow in the way of Jesus, allow Christ and Christ alone to sit on the throne of your heart, this is what happens. Your roots actually grow down deep into the rich soil of God's great love. Now we've got two trees up here, and as you can see, this one on the left is struggling. It's dying. It hasn't had water in weeks, sunlight in days. It's been in the back in the dark forever. Some of you are really angry with me about this tree. Let me remind you, you can email me all your complaints, Ronnie Norman at firstcolonychurch.org. Happy to answer every email. And in this tree, I mean, it's getting light, it's getting water. I check on it every week. It's getting some attention. It's doing, doing pretty well. And every week we've, we've come into this place and I've asked you this question or something like it. I've asked you, which tree are you more like? Are you more like this tree that's struggling that's dying because you're not spending any time over time in the presence of Jesus? Or are you more like this tree that's, that's growing and flourishing and thriving because it's getting the light of Christ, it's getting water every week, it's, it's getting everything it needs to grow and flourish and thrive? Which tree are you more like? I've asked you that question every week. Can I ask it again but ask it a little different? Can we dial it in a little bit more? And if I may be so bold, can I ask you, which tree are your kids more like? Which tree are your grandkids more like? Are they growing and flourishing and thriving or not? And you see, this is why prayer is so vital. It's why it's such an important part of the process of raising our kids so they can grow and flourish and thrive. Prayer you know what prayer is? Prayer is literally how we usher our kids into the light of the presence of Jesus. You ever done this? You ever just sat in a quiet place alone with God? Maybe you pull up an empty chair beside you just to imagine that he's right there next to you. And maybe it's one of those days you don't even pray with words. You just imagine in a moment of prayer you taking your kids by the hand, walking them into the light of the presence of Jesus. And you know Jesus loves to welcome children. You usher your kids into the light of the presence of Jesus. This is why prayer is so important. Because we know which tree we want our kids to be like and become. If you're a parent, if you're a grandparent, you know this proverb. We know it well. Proverbs 22, 6. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's a proverb. It's generally true. We, we all know children who didn't grow up with 
parents who were full of faith, but yet they grew up to be incredible men or women of God. And we also know incredible parents of faith who love God with all of their heart, mind, soul, body, and strength, and yet somehow their kids grew up and for whatever reason walked away from God. It's a proverb. It's generally true. If you train up your kids in the way they should go when they're old, they won't depart from it. That's generally true. You know what is true, though? This is true. That if we pray this and we practice this, if we take time over time, to come into the presence of Christ and allow him to make his home in our hearts. Our roots will grow down deep into the rich soil of God's great love. And the same is true for our children. If they will come to a place where they allow Christ to make his home in their hearts, their roots will grow down deep into the rich soil of his great love and they will become strong. We pray this for ourselves. We pray this for our children. We usher them into the light of the presence of Jesus. And then Paul prays this, verse 18, and I love this part of the prayer. This is what he prays for his sons and daughters in the faith. He prays that they will have the power to understand, as all God's people should, just how wide and how long and how high and how deep his love really is. He prays, may may you experience, you hear that word? May you experience the love of Christ. Experience it, though it's it's too great to understand fully then. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and the power that comes from God. By the way, just a quick side note, there is power in praying Scripture. And there is power in praying Scripture over your kids. Whenever, Whenever you pray God's word, whenever you pray God's God's breath on a page, whenever you pray God's heart over your kids, into your kids, for your kids, you know what you're doing, right? You're just asking God to do what he already said he wants to do in their hearts and lives. There is power in praying scripture, praying the word of God over our children. Paul Paul prays this prayer and what he's asking God to do is, is to help his children in the faith, his sons and daughters in the faith, just to somehow catch a glimpse of just how great God's love really is. And he wants them not just to know about it, he wants them to know it. He wants them to experience it. And you know this, there's, there's a difference in, in knowing about someone and knowing someone. There's a difference between knowing about God and knowing God. And this is what Paul wanted for his friends. He didn't want them to just know about God. We can get really good at memorizing facts and verses and scriptures about God. But it's something different to know God, to experience God. And and what Paul wanted for these sons and daughters in the faith is for them to experience God's love, experience his grace. It's one thing to know about his love. It's something else entirely to experience God's love. It's one thing to know about the cross. It's something entirely different to stand at the foot of the cross and realize what God has done for you and for me in and through Jesus. It's one thing to know about his grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness of all of your sin. It's something else entirely to walk through the waters of baptism and to experience God washing away your sin. God, but what, what Paul wanted was for them to, to not just know about God, but to know God, to experience his great love for them. And he prayed this prayer that they would understand just how high and how wide, how long and how deep his love really is. He wanted them not just to know about God, but to know him and to experience his love, to know him and to know their need for him. And I just wonder today, what are you praying And what are you praying for your kids? There was a woman by the name of Annie Sherwood Hawks. She was a mother of three who lived from 1853, 1835 to 1918. Now you may have, you may never have heard of Annie Hawks, but you probably have heard of her songs. She wrote over 400 hymns. She, uh, she was a mother of three, and it was uh, a beautiful day, summer day in June. 
June 1872. She was in her apartment with her three young children. Annie was a dedicated and committed member of her church, the Hanson Place Baptist Church. She was going about her daily tasks, doing the kinds of things that moms have always done and always do, all those thankless jobs that, that go relatively unnoticed until they don't get done. You know what I mean? Like she was doing what she does. Her kids were playing in the corner, doing whatever they do. When all of a sudden, Annie just became aware of her desperate need for God. And, and I want you to hear something Annie wrote as she reflected on that day. She writes, suddenly, I became so filled with a sense of nearness to the master that wondering how one could live without him, either in joy or pain. These words were ushered into my mind, the thought at once taking full possession of me. I need thee every hour. And Annie sat down. And she wrote the words to this familiar hymn. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. Every hour I need thee. Oh, bless me now, my Savior. I come to thee. Can you imagine? being one of her three children, hearing their mom walking around the house, singing the words to that song. Can you imagine growing up in a home where your mother daily confessed her desperate need for God? Annie wanted her kids not just to, to know God, but to know their need for God. And these are the words to a familiar song, but they're more than that, aren't they? They're the words to a prayer. And prayer, the reason this prayer, the reason these kinds of prayer are so important is because these prayers, they pave the way for our kids to know God. To know their need for God and to grow up understanding not just that there is a God, but there's a God of us and wants us to know him and wants us to be aware of our need for him. And not just that, but that Jesus Christ himself wants to make his home in our hearts. And today, if I could encourage you, encourage us to do anything, it's just simply this. Some of you are already doing it, but keep doing it. Keep praying for your children. It is, it is an incredible blessing to have a mother that cares for you. It is an incredible blessing to have a mother that prays for you. And as we pray for our children, we usher them into the presence of Jesus, where, oh, by the way, they will find everything they need.